after UK, we will look what's happening in uh, Switzerland, especially at the ETH Zurich, which is one of the most important research institutions in Switzerland, with EPFL, of course. And uh, since a few years, ETH is uh, busy with uh, the issues of research data. Thank you very much, Dr. Tur. Good morning. Um, I'm very grateful to the organizers to have put my presentation after Christopher Brown's because um, the stage is set very nicely, I think, um, including the uh, um, questions. Um, I would like you to, to note my position as a service provider inside of a research university. And um, I would also like you to note that uh, probably about, for, for every statement I make, there might be nine of 10 people here agreeing or disagreeing. And uh, this is a very um, characteristic um, issue with the topic of uh, research data and even more so for open research data. So please um, try to keep this um, in mind. Another note in advance, in, when I'm talking about uh, open data, it's uh, very much about file-based data. It's not about uh, massive uh, volumes of uh, big data, chunks, unstructured data. It's about the data all of us have on our uh, machines when we are doing uh, research or writing papers or things like that. We collaborate um, closely with the IT services at ETH Zurich when it comes to managing um, bigger amounts of um, data, and they provide all the infrastructure for our services. Um, so there are solutions, but what we are doing is something a lot more modest, actually, but it concerns a lot more people, as far as I can see. So um, what we want to achieve when we talk about open data is to bring data from everyone's desktop, actually, to um, the open domain, where this is possible, and we will see why there may be restrictions. Some have been already mentioned um, here, and there are intermediate stages where it's at least important to know that data is there, and then you might still want to talk to the people who actually did it. Um, we Occasionally, we talk to researchers, which is a good idea, basically. And uh, some of their comments on the issue of um, open data um, go in the direction uh, you already mentioned. Uh, we are struggling to keep up with publications and uh, even to manage our own data. We just don't have time to deal with other people's data of which we know too little of, of the context. We do not even know if um, we have the right question uh, to pose towards this um, kind of data. This was a very nice one also, maybe true only for one domain, but still it's there. Um, secondary analysis in our field just doesn't qualify for publication in top journals. We even tried to make data available in a, a subject-specific repository, but it was uh, quite a lot of work and uh, we didn't see um, the point of it in the end. And this also applies to um, um, certain journals. You don't have to argue with me about these arguments, but unfortunately they are, they are there and they are real. They are real concerns. And um, perhaps with the last one you can see what might be the, the direction to mitigate this actually. If all the journals um, had policies in this way, then there would no, no, be, uh, no longer be a way to escape from that if you really want to um, push for this, but still um, journals are a tool for um, publishing research results and uh, researchers feel they are not actually paid to make data accessible, but they are paid for doing research and for producing knowledge and to put that out to, to society and uh, to their peers. So. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are making data available. We see them, they have their repositories and things are working nicely. But we took a um, somewhat different approach uh, and started from the back end, if you, if you want to see it like that, from the curational and preservational end. And then we tried to um, occasionally slip in some arguments for making data 
um, openly available. Because there are some underlying issues behind some of these questions, which are not just concerned with the, the effort to make data openly available, but um, questions which have already been uh, mentioned about um, crediting, also a real concern about um, the scientifically sound reuse of data. Do other people do what uh, the data actually allows? And on the other end, when it comes to data reuse, um, can I rely on uh, the data producers having done their work really properly? Or what checks do I have to apply to, uh, to make sure that that's the case? And even more so, um, can I rely on data being citable and um, being available in any year's time from now? So, um, some of these things might change over time, but some uh, researchers we talked to, they very explicitly said, we are willing to uh, use almost any tool as long as we don't have to really change our um, workflows in research because the research is their business and uh, other things should adapt to the way they do their research but not the other way around, that they adapt the way they are researching just in order to put out uh, open data in the end. So the uh, good news is that at least uh, one a certain degree of sharing is quite common and uh, that's probably um, something everyone of you as well knows. You're sharing data with colleagues you are working with, you know those people, you know how they work, you know um, what they are up to. Um, there's a certain degree of trust established and uh, this is a way of uh, working almost any group you talk to uh, can agree to, apart from those who have agreement with the uh, industry not to make anything public and uh, not even to put data on the central infrastructure at ETH. So there's always an exception, um, no matter what you're talking about. There are much more reservations when it comes to just putting data out in the open. I've um, listed uh, some of the concerns on the uh, previous slides. And you still have to keep in mind there's in, in many cases, just too little experience. People are not quite sure what will happen. We, most of us, don't know either. There are small communities where open data is working very well, and um, there are others where it's, uh, uh, well, almost, um, um, don't know, almost criminal to do so, or at least regarded like that. So, in fact, we believe that um, the openness and the preservation of data, they have uh, quite a lot of common when it comes to this uh, layer of trust in between. So um, it is in fact uh, more than that this is two phases of the same metal. If we have data preserved but no one can access it, it's not really um, um, that useful. It might um, serve for some time for data producers themselves to show, well, we have done our work properly, but Otherwise, there's not much in it. If data is um, available but without uh, context documentation, you have raised um, the issue as well, um, then it might not be too useful either. And um, it may only be used by the original producers um, still, and even they. You know that if you've worked in the laboratory and you go back to what you've done a year ago, uh, you will have to look into your own notes very carefully to really um, get what um, you have done in detail. So, um, on the other hand, um, if data is only temporarily made available, but you cannot quite be sure that it uh, will remain like that, then your trust, again, is very much compromised in um, using this data. So, um, what we try to um, achieve is improve the um, conditions for reuse by making sure that data is uh, at least not kept on some external hard disks. And I think most of you know that uh, vast amounts of data are just there because it's cheap and uh, practical and uh, you can get it at a um, media market or something, something like that. But uh, of course, that's not um, the basis for, for sharing data actually. Um, there are some more constraints. I won't go into too much detail here, although this is um, 
important background information if there is the intention to make data um, available. There should be a minimum degree of context information which at least enables a potential reuser to get back to the data producer and to talk to him or her about the data. Because I personally um, would be very um, concerned with just using data without having talked to the people um, who produced it. I think that might work in very narrow domains with agreed standards on data description and data reuse. That will work and we know that it works, for example, in uh, uh, seismological um, research. That's a community who exchange uh, data quite freely um, and ad adhere to very um, narrow standards. So um, this is a good basis, but in other areas this just um, is not the case. So the approach we took is to address existing needs first instead of um, convincing people that they have a different need in making data openly available. And the uh, current needs are that there are a lot of people who feel they should do something about the way they manage their own data. A lot of groups have very good uh, processes in place and uh, we won't interfere with them, but others feel we could do this better and these CD-ROMs in, in our drawers are not quite um, the best way to do it. And they exist, I don't make this up, they exist and you know that probably. Um, first step also in the direction of making data open is to put data in a more reliable and more stable environment instead of hard disks and offline media. And um, some researchers also come up with the need to make some data available for reviewers or for um, partners who should have online access for that. And that's at least the first step in, in the direction um, which we might be able to support. On the way, then, we, from, from time to time, we can slip in some uh, uh, more ideas like um, we tell people, well, generally we make the metadata for your data available online and people can search it. And sometimes, at first, people are a bit, mm, do I really want that? But then they, when they think twice, they sometimes think, um, well, okay, if someone sees it, we, we can look what they, if they contact us, if they, maybe the, something is in there for us to do, do a new project or something like that. That's a very ideal um, way to put it, but it happens from time to time. So uh, we sometimes only publish metadata now and then afterwards they come up with, well, actually you can make the data available as well. And a very important incentive to put data in a central location is uh, the possibility to cite data in your own publications that you get a digital object identifier for your data sets and can put the, this as a reference into your own manuscript and then um, people reading the paper can um, get back to supplementary um, data. In a very abstract view, what we um, would like to achieve is to come to well-defined data sources in research groups to um, data in a central ETH data archive. The nasty thing is that these uh, well-defined sources hardly exist um, because they are very individual solutions in all the research groups and uh, you cannot really rely on this. So a more realistic view, which we have still not um, achieved, um, could look like this, that we have um, a variety of sources on the left, like uh, laboratory information management systems, where they exist, um, or data management platforms. One example from ETH is this uh, OpenBIS in uh, systems biology. Um, and we hope to interface with such existing solutions to get data into a central repository where it can be refer referenced from the outside world via uh, digital object identifiers. As I said, we are still not even there. Um, the situation is a bit, uh, um, well, yes, I think it's, it's just not the reality that those solutions exist. So we try to... Uh, put in place an even more modest um, approach, which is the uh, tool DocuTeam Packer, which was already mentioned, with a very slim 
a local client for editing a file structure as you might want uh, to do that in your uh, Windows Explorer and um, add metadata on these um, data. We think, as I said before, that context information is crucial if you ever want to uh, enable um, discovery and reuse of um, research data. And um, afterwards, data can be submitted from this solution to um, the central data archive, where it uh, can be accessed um, online from the outside world. We publish DOIs with the data site consortium, which also means that a certain uh, set of metadata is openly available um, for such data sets and can also be re-harvested from, from other um, service providers. Um, that's the route we want to take, and in the afternoon there's a um, small workshop on the Packer tool, which is really, it's not a sophisticated um, thing, it's quite, quite a nice, um, handy thing, and um, pe people uh, seem to like it. Um, in fact, they um, always invent new uses for it, which we um, didn't even have in mind. We just wanted them to put data together and send it to the archive, but now they start to... Uh, manage their data locally and we are actually not quite sure if we uh, can really support that as um, they want it. But so at least it serves a purpose and people uh, are happy with it, so it's a good thing. It's, um, that's um, I think what I, what I said already. One thing might be interesting here, it also allows the uh, DOI creation as long as data resides still on your own storage. Of course, the DOI is then not active as a link, but uh, will only be uh, registered uh, once data is in the central um, data archive, but still you can obtain the DOI and um, already refer to it in your uh, manuscript. But of course, you should make sure to submit data um, before this is published. Uh, you can also assign access rights, which, uh, access rights, which will then be enforced by the data archive in the end. Also retention periods, because we try to cover both the really long-term um, um, preservation of data, as well as uh, the uh, safeguarding of data for only limited periods of time. So you can choose if this should be kept in the archive for only 10 or 15 years, or if it should be um, kept forever. While the top thing is what uh, researchers or anyone who uses the tool sees, the part which is uh, interesting for us is what happens in the background, because this tool creates a submission information package. Probably some of you have uh, heard this from the Open Archive Information Standard Reference Model, which is a package of metadata together with the data, which can then be um, archived as, as a kind of container, in fact. And it produces this according to uh, standards, and it does this without people working with the tool, having to know what they are doing in the background. So that's the nice stuff we can then take to ingest into our um, central archival solution. Uh, this may be um, necessary. The list looks a bit long. You wonder what, uh, what is left afterwards, but uh, this is... Um, <laughs> Um, the thing is that, uh, as I said, people start to get new ideas of uh, what you can do with this, but there are a lot of things other tools will do much better. For example, I know many people don't like Microsoft SharePoint, but still a lot of uh, things people have in mind with this tool is actually things you should be doing in, in a document management system, such as Microsoft SharePoint, for example. So there's a lot um, you should probably think about, but um, still I think there remains uh, a bit of things you can do um, with the tool. Um, who should be using this or who actually is using this is still in early stages, but these are groups we have identified to um, start to work with it. In some groups they collect um, all the data belonging to one uh, manuscript submission to a journal. Um, all the uh, versions of the manuscript, uh, the correspondence with the editors and uh, uh, image data and all the tables in the background and keep that as one package um, in their own archive. Others want to um, 
prescribe a um, template structure for uh, the PhD students to tell them, well, we put everything from this method in this folder and it should be described in this way, these metadata should be used. And uh, what is nice for us, might not be that much of interest for you, is that we can also use it for the administrative archives at um, ETH Zurich, where uh, administrative staff can put in their data and the process of uh, data appraisal, which is done by archival staff, can also be performed in this tool. This is just to give you a very brief impression. It doesn't look like much, I admit, uh, we didn't invest in in the looks very much, but um, still, we think it's almost self-explanatory and um, has a tree view of your folders and files. You can have a preview of uh, um, the uh, common suspect like office formats and uh, images and PDFs and everything. And uh, of course, not of um, uh, more exotic um, data formats. So we achieve um, in the end that um, quite a bit of work in terms of uh, making data shareable and preservable is already done on this um, level. I still doubt that it will be possible to really do scientific work on data only with uh, data available here if you don't have um, contact with the original researchers, but still you can get an idea. might be interesting to talk to these people um, um, it's interesting for us. And by the way, we also have um, customers. I don't want to, to make that sound so, so negative, but also we have customers who make data available because they say, with our methods, we have done everything, but we know that other groups in our field, they use different methods. They might um, be interested in doing something more. So this is small starts, but um, sometimes it happens, and we are happy to support this. Um, just to get this right, there will be no obligation to use this tool in order to archive um, data in the archive. There will other, be other routes. We use a simple web upload when it comes to uh, upload just a package with a um, rudimentary uh, metadata set. We also have um, batch processes for larger um, data volumes, and especially for data where metadata is available in some form. And it's always useful to talk to people to find out what they really want to do because sometimes they have, a, have an idea which is a bit um, off the mark and we might have even tools in place which serve their purposes much better than they um, had in mind. Um, I was asked to mention um, how this approach might fit in on a, on a wider level. Some of you might have heard of the Swiss University Conference program on um, uh, scientific information access, processing, and safeguarding. And um, within this program, uh, some institutions are working on a proposal on data lifecycle management, which tries to address issues over the life cycle of research data in general from storage over capture and management of data, processing, preservation, creation, sharing, and publishing, which is, sounds actually like a lot of work and is a lot of work. Um, we will probably have to focus um, within the proposal, but still um, I encourage you to, to um, watch what is going on um, within this program. Under this uh, email address you can also inscribed to a mailing list um, with further information on the program as a whole. There's a proposal due for mid-February 2015, and the idea is to build on um, experience which is already there in Swiss higher education institutions with, um, interestingly, with very different um, focal points. In some cases, it's more about open access. In other cases, it's more about um, storage. In our, our case, it's more about um, um, curation um, with these particular tools. Uh, involved currently are um, eight institutions with um, the lead being at University of Geneva. Pierre-Yves Burgi is also here and Elian Blumer I've also seen. He's there if you want to contact him. I didn't want, uh, didn't want to put your email address in here so uh, if you want to contact him just mail me and I will um, direct, redirect you. 
And um, yes, I encourage you to, to follow what's going um, on there. And um, Pierre is certainly happy to answer questions on this. And I'm happy to answer questions on our approach. And um, there is uh, the workshop um, in the afternoon for, I think there is still room for a few people um, if you are interested in this. But you can also um, use this more or less independently um, from us. So I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Are there some uh, questions to, for Dr. Tuve? Fell in developing this tool? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I think uh, ETH uh, began before EBF. <laughs> so. <laughs> but, um, well, I, 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 I cannot promise anything, of course, but we are open for, for um, these contacts. And as you said, uh, saw EPFL is also in this, um, involved in this project. So. Uh, um, we are in contact. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you said the, the scientists can decide the retention period. Is that not bad for preservation? And uh, what was your reasoning behind allowing that? Uh, that's one question. And the second one is, uh, do you accept any kind of file formats? And again, how does that, uh, what are your concerns about the preservation there? Yeah. Um, the uh, retention periods, well, we, we start with uh, 10 years at a minimum, so that's when it's uh, reasonable to think about, and this is a, if you don't have any other um, preconditions from your funding agencies, this is more or less agreed that uh, 10 years is a minimum for, for retention. Um, it's not our um, idea to preserve as much data as possible um, forever, but to preserve it um, for um, as long as it is useful. I know that's dangerous to, to, to judge, but we think if there are people who can um, have an idea on um, how long their data might be of use, then it's researchers themselves. Um, of course, there is the danger that data might disappear after 10 years' time, and after 12 years you realize, hmm, might have been interesting, but uh, yes, that's just the case. And in a way, it's related to the second question, by this, we also try to um, um, limit the, uh, the workload in uh, managing data formats which might not actually um, be long-lived enough um, for, uh, for the long run. Because basically we accept any file format, but we only um, assure preservation in the narrow sense for formats we can actually identify and validate. For any other data, we just um, assure that we keep it as is, and it's actually the producer's or the user's um, problem to um, make use of it uh, when it comes to it. We try, of course, to discuss with the researchers if there are um, open standards they might be um, willing to use in addition to, to the formats they work with, but um, actually we accept um, everything, yeah. Did you already have had the case to, um, for researchers living um, uh, ETH and wanting to have their data with them? Um, we, are, we are thinking without it and we are actually discussing this with um, the legal services um, as well because in uh, the uh, ETH legislation, because e the ETH um, law quite clearly states that any um, data belongs to ETH, so they will probably not be able to take it away from ETH, mm -hmm. but they will probably be able to take it with them uh, as a copy. That's um, the working hypothesis at the moment, but um, I, it's not, not really uh, printed and stamped anywhere, so uh, that's the idea. 
I have another question. Now, uh, research groups are very international. And how do you cope with that? Do you give access to other institutes in, in, in other countries to your tool, or how do you do that? Um, for those cases, we can, can uh, handle access on the uh, archive. When data is archived centrally, then we have web access and can configure that for individuals or um, groups. But with this tool, that's really a local approach, um, which will be Technically, it will not be impossible to use it um, remotely, but um, then it becomes very difficult to, to support the whole process. So the, the tool, Docker Team Pekka, we really only support for local use in, in ETH. But it, ex it means that if a group, so if there is an international collaboration and then only it, and there is an ETH member in this international corporation, then the other member of the collaboration cannot access the data. They can access the data once it has been archived but not as long as it's in this preparatory phase uh, on the local, local storage. But afterwards we can, can configure that. And um, likewise we can also enable a, a remote upload to the central archive that will be via, via the web or via another service. But with this particular editing tool it won't work too well, I'm afraid. Thank you very much to our speakers of this first part of the morning. I invite you now for a coffee break, and if you want some information about the workshops this afternoon, don't hesitate to look at, this, um, at the papers on the board. And we will um, begin again at uh, half past 11. Uh, you have some stands on this side, so you can uh, learn about initiatives related to research data and take some contacts. Thank you.